while Miller was getting ready, I'll just mention a couple things. Uh, my name is Dawn. I'm the director of Miller Rapa Center, um, where Venerable Amy used to be the director. So we're very happy to have her back here with us. Um, and she's here tonight. She's at the Catamount Arts tomorrow night in St. Johnsbury at 6 p.m. Um, giving another talk on karma. So come to that if you would like. Um, there is also a weekend retreat happening this weekend at Millerapa Center with Venerable Amy. Um, it's a long room retreat. Um, sort of kind of go through the whole stages of the pack. If you're interested in that, um, see me in the back afterwards. Um, and then I just want to point out there's a bathroom in the back of the room. And then um, there's a table with some free books, some information about the center. Um, and then... Um, there's a list if you'd like to get um, our newsletter from the center that will let you know when things are happening, um, when we're having programs, retreats, any good things like that. You can sign up for that back there. Just please make sure you write clearly so I can read your name to enter it. Um, and then Venerable Amy also has some information here. Um, she's going to be leading a pilgrimage to Laudo next year. Um, I highly suggest checking it out. Um, <laughs> and. Thank you for coming. Thanks for coming. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to spill that. Okay. There's um, one other thing I was going to do. Okay. So we're all going to silence our phones, right? Please. If you don't mind, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Just to begin, and, and we finish. We finish at 7:30. Is that right? 7:30. Okay, great. We we often um, we've been doing this for many years. I, I've come here like one, one, two, three times a year, and um, we always go over. And Rachel and George used to be like, you know, it's all like we're leaving. We're, we're locking you in, you know. And so I'm going to try to stick to the schedule. And also. What Dawn is mentioning, this weekend retreat at Millerapa Center, when she mentions about the Lam Rim, so Lam means path, and Rim is stages or steps. So it's steps on the path, and what that means is it's our overall philosophy in the tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, the Gelug or Galugpa tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. You don't need to worry about all the terminology, but just for those that want to orient, to um, what is this weekend program, but I think we're also going to talk about joy and um, how is it possible to have joy in our lives right now in this very challenging time on the planet. And uh, the Lam Rim, these topics of the philosophy that take you through why it's advantageous to be human and why are we not appreciating that situation enough? What gets in the way of that? W what about your mind? So it's only a couple of days, and we get to go a little deeper than, obviously, a class like this. So, you, so this is just a little taste, just talking about one specific topic of dealing with challenging people, okay? <laughs> dealing with challenging people, which um, is really not anything that any of us have any problem with, right? <laughs> is that right? That's what I thought. So, so I want to talk about that this evening. And what I'd like to do first to start is one of our main ways to orient our mind in dealing with challenging people and challenging situations is to put your mind in the right direction. You know, we're in charge of our minds. No one else is, by the way. In fact, that your mind is the only thing in the world, are you ready for this? The only thing in the world you can control is your mind, not anybody else. Not your mother, not your partner, not your kids. And so, um, so I just wanted to mention that. And it is difficult to control the mind. There's no question. And a lot of people are like, I'm not even in control of my mind right now. So, so, but the main way that we start is setting a motivation. You're directing the intention in a certain way. And um, so what we do in our tradition is we are focused on benefiting and helping all living beings. That includes yourself. 
all living beings, or they'll say all sentient, all sentient beings. Sentient means with a mind, beings that have a mind, and that's all of us here in this room. And that's all the beings on the planet. And Buddhism includes things, insects and animals are sentient. Okay? So how do I help all living beings when I can't even help myself? Okay? A lot of people think like that. So we have this notion, if I can become fully awake, a fully awakened being. Buddha means, in Sanskrit, fully awake. That's what it means. If I can reach that place, I'm unlimited in how I can help all beings. I have all the power to help all living beings. Buddhas are omniscient. Omniscient means all-knowing. If you're all-knowing and someone comes to you and says, I need help, I, you know, I'm having trouble at work, and my relationship's a mess, and my, my, my kid is totally addicted to this or that, right? What, what can I, can you help me? And, and what do you do? You advise from what you know. But is anybody here, is any of your knowledge, I'm just curious, because you never know which Buddha is sitting amongst us. Is anybody's knowledge unlimited? If you can just put your hand up. Does anybody feel like they've got all the knowledge? Right? We don't. We, we often, as human beings, not Buddha, as a human being, my knowledge is limited. So because it's limited, when someone comes to me, I, you take your life experience, and you take whatever type of good heart you have to try to advise them, but I don't actually fully know. So I say what I think will help, but it might not be. So a Buddha, being omniscient, knows, capital K, knows it all. So they are going to advise you Every moment they're living, breathing, of what is the best thing for these beings? What's the best thing if someone comes and asks advice? What's the best way for you to act in a situation that arises? And all day long, all of us are interacting with other beings in one way or another. And we like it when it goes well. That's wonderful. And it's easy, and when we're around our friends, we can relax a little bit. It's comfortable. But sometimes it doesn't go well. Right? And then what? So some of you already have great coping mechanisms, and you have enough <coughs> life experience. There's some seats up here, too, if you, if you, feel, if you feel that adventurous. <coughs> so some of you, due to your own life experience, um, do advise from a place. But sometimes we muck it up. Or sometimes that challenge arises. <coughs> and I'm too tired to deal with it, and then something, this opens, and something negative slips out. And then later I go home and I sulk, and I guiltily obsess about how horrible I am, and how, why did I say that, and then I talk to my partner about it, and then I talk to some friends, and then I analyze it to death, and then it, I feel worse. Right? So it's not useful. It's not useful, but a lot of us have patterns like that, and it is simply normal for the human condition. So the beginning is relax, and the beginning of practice in general is, is just relax. <clears throat> okay. So what I'd like you to do to start is let's just close our eyes, wherever you're seated, and if you feel to sit up straight, and if you're in a chair, have your feet straight down, perfectly fine, no problem meditating in a chair. <clears throat> Just begin to notice a normal, natural breath moving through your system. And every time you inhale, imagine you're opening up space in the body mind. And each exhalation is a release of any tension you might be storing in your body and mind. And just bringing yourself to as relaxed a place as possible.
and setting our motivation, putting that proper intention in your mind, meaning you are directing your awareness where you would like it to go, <coughs> as opposed to being distracted and having your awareness pulled in a variety of directions by the external influences around you. You're directing your awareness and you can do this every moment you think about it. So through the day you become imbalanced, you can reestablish your motivation. So in this tradition, the tradition I am in, again, we're very focused on benefiting all living beings. Imagine the planet if we were all focused in that way. Reflect for a moment on how you feel about wanting to help others and wanting to help yourself along the way. And what if you lived in a space where you could do that every moment perfectly, effortlessly, without any fear or constraints, without any distractions, and you were happy all of the time. So just imagining and reflecting on that space, take a moment right now to set a positive intention for our time together. So if you'd like to think about fully waking up to benefit all living beings, you can set that intention, or whatever intention you'd like not only for our time together, but all the activities of the rest of your day. And then I'd like you to bring up one of your difficult, challenging people in your lives, just one. Just like you to recall this person. And if possible, I'd like you to visualize them right now <clears throat> in the space seated across from you, facing you. <laughs> if you have trouble visualizing, just imagine as if they're there and notice right now, as you're seated in front of this person, just notice how you begin to feel body and mind. So take a little moment to rejoice at yourself right now because number one, you got yourself here into the room. I think it's a good position. And then you set a good motivation, fantastic. A great orientation. And now here we are. Here's you and your person. You have this perfect opportunity to transform your mind. One of the best things you can do right now for the planet is to transform your mind into something more positive, something more loving. So I'd like you now to think about this person in front of you. I'd like you to recall, if, it, if it's possible, a recent situation. If not recent, go back 
because the person may have passed away as well. You can also use someone who's passed away. Someone who, in a sense, holds you hostage. I'd like you to recall one of the nasty incidences that the two of you were engaged in. Just try to think of one of these situations that was uncomfortable for you and allow it, push that play button on the recording. Just take a couple minutes of the interaction, noting what they are doing or saying, noting what you are doing, saying, and thinking and just roll a couple minutes of this time, this precious time, with your precious person. And feel free to be honest in this interaction. Did you end up screaming at them? Did you break down and cry? Did you repress something? Did you say something really awful to them? Just notice, just observe. Without judgment right now, you're just observing. We're watching a movie, that's all. We're simply watching this movie so we can develop our minds in a more positive direction. It's an educational video. Right now I'd like you to press the pause button. Now let's reflect. What are we going to do with this person? They're not really holding us hostage. Only you are. So let's analyze what's happening here. First of all, what was your motivation in this interaction? What did you want? And did you get what you wanted? Was it reasonable what you wanted? Was it realistic? Here's a big step. What do you think their motivation was in the interaction? So number one, we notice when we're having trouble with someone, when we're fighting with someone or disagreeing with someone, we rarely are considering what's going on for them. It's usually all about me. So did they accomplish what, what you think their motivation was? Did they get what they wanted?
Do you think they're innately cruel, this person? They could be confused, correct? To you, they're appearing to come from a confused space. Are you ever confused? So there, you have something now in common with them, in that at times, we are both confused. Let's analyze a little bit more. Fundamentally, don't you want to be happy and not suffer? Look across at your person. <coughs> don't you think they want to be happy and not suffer? Everybody wants to be happy and not suffer. So now you have a second thing in common with them, is that you both want to be happy and you don't want to suffer. So here's a third thing to think about. In Buddhism, we talk about everyone having Buddha nature. Buddha nature. It does not mean you're a Buddha, but it means you have a seed, a potential in your mind that can ripen into a fully realized being, a Buddha. And every being with a mind has that potential. So you may say, well, there's terrorists on the planet and they don't have the same nature that I have. But Buddhism says everyone has a seed of goodness. Some just have more obscurations and veils covering that seed. Our practice is stripping away the veils and the obscurations. So for some, they're thicker, but fundamentally, and again, look across at your special person. We both have Buddha nature. We have a seed, a potential, that can ripen into a fully awake, awakened being. So how do you feel about the person now, now that you have three things in common with them? Look across at them. Now based on the interaction, are you completely clear what is happening for them during this interaction? Do you happen to know their minds? Do you know that they have a sick child at home? Do you know that they're worried about their money? They're having relationship issues? They hate their job? What else do you think you know about them? but you're not really sure now if it's accurate. So for a moment now, I'd like you to exchange places with this person. So as if you're in their body, and they're across in your body, and you are looking out through their eyes right now, back at you, angry. Imagine you are them. 
they are you. What is it like to look out of their eyes in this interaction, looking back at you, angry? Are you pleasant to fight with? Are you pleasant to have a disagreement with? Imagine that looking out through their eyes. How does that feel? So come back into your own body, looking across at your challenging person, and just consider, have they made a mistake? Are they inaccurate in whatever behavior they're showing? Have you ever made a mistake and been inaccurate? Do you have some level of your heart right now that can layer some acceptance towards them. Just accepting this is the human condition. It is flawed. That's its nature. It doesn't mean we're bad people because we make mistakes. It's just simply what is. Through this acceptance, can I open my heart a little bit more towards them? considering first some empathy in that I've also done a similar thing at times. Feeling some compassion towards them. You can imagine some white light coming from your heart center over towards them and enveloping them with the empathy, with the compassion, with some loving kindness. Why not send this positive experience out to the planet rather than the hatred and the hostility, which there is enough of? Why doesn't it come normally? Because we haven't practiced enough, that's all. And especially this person needs it. Especially the person we view as other, we have to be creative and have great sustenance to reach across that divide and find a way to make a healthy relationship, especially with them. This is our job right now on the planet. So I'd like you to roll back the recording, rewind, with the exercise we just did, you're going to push play again and roll yourself through those couple of minutes you've already explored. It's not about changing the other person, it is you changing your mind, your attitude. So as you let those moments roll out, the person will say exactly what they said before and act exactly as they did before. How would you like to counter? You can change your behavior. So this is your role play. We have to practice. This is one of the ways we practice. So allow that to play out and see if anything has changed and you just try your best.
So begin to wrap up your situation. And as you look across at your person, feel free to conclude with any acknowledgement right now or gesture you'd like to make to them. And slowly allow them to dissolve back into the space from where they came. Please relax and slowly you may open your eyes. with these challenging beings, these challenging people in our acceptance, if we'd like to explore the acceptance, which is hard, there is this idea that they're doing the best they can. And some people are more obscure than others, right? And sometimes we really mess up. And in those moments, sometimes I'm doing the best I can. You know? We're racing through our lives. We're probably too busy, often. There's many distractions around us. Now we have these, this technology that distracts us further. We get off balance. You bump up against somebody else off balance. Boom. So if we're more fluid, practicing, realizing, well, you know, sometimes we bump up against people and, you know, it's like that then there's more gentleness. Gentleness towards myself, first of all, in my imbalance. Sometimes I'm imbalanced. Hey, that's life as a human being. So when somebody else is imbalanced as well, and I come into their space, I'm more forgiving, more accepting. If I'm holding myself to a certain rigidity, and you know, that's where it starts with our own hearts, our own minds. Any questions or observations from the meditation? Anything anybody wants to, anything, anything you observed? Was it helpful? I find sometimes it's easier to do the meditation with this discussion of, um, you know, how do we actually get in there. These meditations are often designed to be done again and again. You don't change your mind with one meditation because you have 40, 50 years of one pattern of how your mind's operating. How can you just switch it into another reality with one? So again, you go, you go again. You'll sit in front of the person. I had some great strides with someone close to me in my life through doing this meditation away from them so that when I would visit, you know, they lived across the country from me. When I would visit, and I knew we were going to get into this thing. They, and, and I would say they, they pushed my button. They knew how to push the button. Right? So, but it was like their fault. If she wouldn't send the missile out to me, everything would be OK. But the button, I designed the button. The button's in my mind. There's nobody out there to blame. Okay? So a very freeing thing is to let go of the blame and the accusation on the other. We're a society of blamers. It's somebody else's fault. It's always somebody else's problem. You know, I'm having a bad day today. It's somebody else's fault. Okay. So Buddhism takes all of that away, frees you from that, that harness. Totally frees you from that. I found that wonderful. It, we're, as a Buddhist, you are an inner being. An inner being. And that means that whatever is in front of me at any time, I'm watching my mind, observing my mind, and thinking like, well, how's my mind showing up here? What, what's, 
How come I was snippy to her? How come I feel really good about this person? Why am I attached to this? Why is there some hostility here? Oh, look at how uncomfortable I am now. So the other thing is, in the initial thing when you looked across at the person, comfortable or uncomfortable? Uncomfortable, uncomfortable right? For most people, it's uncomfortable. We don't like to be uncomfortable. God forbid in the United States of America. Right? <laughs> I teach around the world, but in the States, we seem to have the most trouble with discomfort. We, we do not want it at all on the horizon. So when it appears, we wriggle and try to do anything, and blaming is one way out of it. You know, it's their problem. They're doing this to me. Okay? So basic mindfulness practice now, which doesn't necessarily make it a Buddhist practice, but mindfulness is a big hot topic in the States right now, and I think it's brilliant. So basic mindfulness is here's the person, and you may have somebody at work, and you know as soon as they walk in, there's like tension in your body. You, every time you're around that person, you know, the holidays are coming up later this year. And Christmas will come, and sometimes you're at a Christmas event, and there's old Uncle Harry that completely pisses you off. Whoever it is, that person in your family, that there's always some issue with him or her. So, so some of the things you can anticipate, but instead of anticipating with tension leading up to it, what if I kind of know I'm going to walk into the room and he's going to be there? How about three deep breaths? This is basic mindfulness practice. Use your breath. You're breathing anyway. Why not use it in a more beneficial way? So, nobody needs to know what you're doing. Another deep breath. You're at the uncomfortable business meeting, and there's the jerk at work sitting across the table. Right? Deep breath. And in the breath, it's okay if you're noticing your thoughts, and your thoughts are like, I oh, can't stand this guy. Look at the shirt he's wearing. <laughs> Did he comb his hair today? It doesn't appear to be. He smells. Right? I mean, these are, this is just normal with that other person. Okay? Use a little humor. Sometimes I'll notice a sweeping judgment in, rising up in my mind, like some wild horse. Here it comes. And then I'm like, what do you know, Amy? What do you know about this person? Look at you. you know, and sometimes I'll even have visualizations of me taking the reins. Whoa, back, back here, okay? So it's perfectly fine. Use humor and use visualization if it works for you. There, and there I am, and I used to do this at, um, when I was a new Buddhist, working for a magazine, and we'd sit around a conference table. There were some very big egos there. And I kind of, as a new Buddhist, was watching, and I'm thinking, God, like, who does this guy think he is? Jeez. But instead, so instead of suddenly, take a deep breath, another deep breath. I'm listening to the meeting. I'm still hearing. I'm here I am. Take another deep breath. And by the end of the third breath, often, perspective opens up in my mind. Some space is there. And I'll be like, and what I can start to do for my practices is I can start to introduce, I did this at some of the business meetings, just as I want to be happy and don't want to suffer, he wants to be happy and doesn't want to suffer. Just as I want to be happy and don't want to suffer, she wants that too. I don't have to say anything, but I'm thinking it in my mind. Instead of, he's such a jerk, look at him, he's so stupid, he doesn't know what he's, you know. Instead, I'm countering, countering the thoughts. I'm not repressing the thoughts. I'm not like, you know, I'm not, I'm not anxious now. I'm not saying, I'm not angry at him. No, I'm kind of going, whoa, those are some pretty uncomfortable thoughts. Okay, there they are. And we have them. I'm not going to deny that I have them. There they go. And you know what? I don't need to attach any more importance to them. And I do not need to over-elaborate them now and make them bigger. Every time we start feeding into the stories, did you ever do this? You go to a party. I just talked to somebody today about this. You go to a party. You go, come into the house, whatever, your dinner party, reception, whatever, right? You see somebody you know across the room. That you, you want to kind of see them, and you know, there's some history, whatever, you want to see them. And they, they see you, but they're engaged already talking with someone. But they see you across the room, and they, they notice you, they see you, 
But then you notice that when they looked over at you, they weren't smiling, and you somehow interpret that there's some problem with you in regard to them. Like somehow there isn't this, you know, and they're, but they're engaged in a conversation already. So first of all, isn't it interesting how I think I'm so important? Number one, they should make a beeline over to me now that I've walked into the room. I'm important. Number two, um, they, they must be talking about me, I'm that important. Must be about me. Right. Number three, the fact that they didn't smile and they've got some kind of funny grimace on their face, funny expression on their face right now, again, I'm so important, it must be about me. My goodness, that's a lot of weight and a lot of trouble for our minds. Right? And then I start a story from there. Well, he's always like that. He always does that. And then he does this. Or she's always, yeah, and then she really, and I know that we had that little thing before at the store, and she must be thinking about, I mean, and then it goes, it rotates into a huge epic saga. You know, and here I am now at the party. Why did I come? I feel off. Oh, there she is. Oh, she's got all her friends around her. I, you know, rather than going over eventually to greet her or him. Hi. Maybe they're held hostage by this person they don't really want to talk to and they don't know how to get out of it. Right? We don't even know. Maybe they have gas. <laughs> but sometimes it's as simple as that and I have just made a sweeping thing and suddenly I'm no good anymore. I'm, and then it goes all into this, but I'm no good, I'm horrible, I never do anything. <coughs> Why did I come to the party? And then you leave early. And you just missed an opportunity for connection. Don't we do this? And then you take it home, and then the story's with you all night. And there it is, and your reputation, and on and on. Boring. It's so boring. We bore ourselves with this stuff, okay? <clears throat> so, and here's another thing with the difficult person. So first of all, we're making up stories that are not accurate. Stop your stories. Notice the story, don't repress it, just notice, go, whoa. Sweeping epic right now, Amy, and I have this myself, Amy, stop. Stop thinking. I even say to myself, stop thinking. <coughs> it's not, not necessary thinking, not positive thinking. I don't need to think that way. It's useless. Because I don't even know what's true. But I'm making something up and I'm invested in it. And then I think it's accurate. Oh my goodness. Right? So first of all, you just notice the bubbles arising and they're bubbles. What's the essence of a bubble? Not much. Nothing there. You, you hit it with your finger, you try to touch it and grab it. Boom. Gone. Okay? So what if you just notice them? Bubbles arising, here comes this person, here they are. The other thing is that the interesting thing about the other person is, and this is a higher level of Buddhism, okay? You actually need that person to, to practice and transform your mind. With your friends, it's easy, and my mind's not really doing that much work. It's easy. I can kind of sit back and relax. I can say whatever I want. I can do, you know, it's okay. They accept me. They forgive me. They love me anyway. Like that. But here comes the difficult person. Well, this is how you practice patience. We're not doing it with our friends. But the difficult person, it's the only way I can, I can perfect patience. You need perfected patience to become a Buddha. So I need this person. In fact, they are that precious to me. That's how you start receiving the other, the challenging person. What if we can get to that mind space where I see them and I'm welcoming them? Like, okay, and I started doing that once with a, with a guy we were working with with this magazine. You can try, where you're looking forward to, you know, tomorrow I know I have that meeting with the person, I really have trouble getting along with them, and they're so difficult in the office, you know, so tomorrow's my. I have a chance here. Right? You know, it is buckle your seatbelt. It's buckle your seatbelt time. And I'm gonna, I'm, I may not get it totally right, but I'm definitely gonna do better than the last time. When the last time I left licking my wounds or freaked out by them, intimidated by them, or angry at them, yelling at them, whatever it is, or just adverse from them, where I'm like, not working with them again. This is my opportunity. And sometimes with this difficult person, here's another thing. What about one kind, simple gesture towards them? Basic kindness. Our planet needs this right now. Basic kindness. Okay? And I mentioned, and some of you heard the story before, but this guy at the magazine that no one liked, 
who really was quite rough with people when I heard him speaking in the office, in his office with other people, and it, you know, it was scary, right? Well, he was so asocial, he didn't really know how to be around other people, politely. He just was scared of other people. Who would have thought that? It's like a chained dog. You see them growling, barking, bared fangs, because they're scared. Because they're scared. If you take them off the leash sometimes, they won't attack you. If you enter their space, they won't necessarily attack you. They're scared. And they're chained, so it's very scary for them. He was chained to these concepts of how he was raised and this behavior pattern. That's all he knew how to do, was kind of lash out at people. So one day, out of, after some practice and learning you know, some new Buddhist techniques, I decided to get him a cup of coffee in the office, like I would have done for anybody else in the office. Genuine, nice cup of coffee. I, I made it, I wanted it to be very natural. You know, I didn't want to kind of make a big, a big thing about it, like, you know, I just got you a cup of coffee, you need to be nice to me. No, it was just, I needed to be natural, so I had to plan it. I had to plan this cup of coffee. I had to plan when his coffee cup would be empty so that it would be natural. When I would come in with a report for him to see, to make it natural with my coffee mug in my hand, to make sure it was the right time to say, oh, um, you want a cup of coffee? I'm, I'm going anyway. Would you like a cup of coffee? Like to make it that ordinary, like you do with other people. But because he was so belligerent, I, I, it was scary. I didn't know what would happen. And I would try it. But first I had to learn how he took his coffee. Another exercise. And I learned with cream only, no sugar. So that took me a week to learn that. And then, and then finally the opportunity, and here I come in, my mug, and here this, and, and suddenly, and then my voice a little wavering, like I was like, I didn't want to blow it, you know. And, would, would, you, would you like a cup of coffee? No one had ever done that with him in the office. So totally disarmed him. I didn't mean to, but he was very, he was like, you know, and he, and he was studying, and he, and, he, and he said, and I'm like kind of reaching for it, like had my hand out for his cup, like, and then he, he said, oh, okay, kind of scared, oh, okay. He had never had the context, he had no practice of what this is like between people. And so I went out, and then, and then what you want to do is make a good, nice cup of coffee. It's not going to be like, you know, throw salt in it. <laughs> I mean, some of us want to do that with the other. But this is, so I made a cup of coffee like I would drink it, you know, and, and, and just came back in, no big deal, no kind of like, here's your coffee, you know, aren't I great? No, here you go, and I left. And that was it, we were friends after that. Just a cup of coffee, that was it. So some simple kind gesture, but it has to be genuine. It has to be genuine, you know, I like your shoes. Um, really nice top. And, and you know, people can feel when it's genuine. You don't want to be dishonest about something. You know, the hair is spiking this way, you know, oh, your hair looks great, you know. Come on. But from that, I had people in the office coming up and asking me, like, quietly, what, what did you do? How is, he loves, like, what did, and I said, I got him a cup of coffee. So it can be something really simple that breaks the ice, because this person is also holding you as other. When you looked out through their eyes, what was that experience like for you? <clears throat> How was that, turning the tables? Hello, is anyone home? <laughs> it was scary. Please, scary. Yeah. I looked, I looked fierce. I was surprised at how angry I looked and how, that other, mm -hmm. how she was really afraid of me. Yeah. Isn't that scary? When you look, like, like, it's very unpleasant to fight with me. When I looked out through the other person's eyes, I was like, oh, wow, we're fierce, aren't we? What was your experience? You that was similar. That I was sitting over there really angry. Mm -hmm. And it made me think how it must be like for that person standing there in front of me, faced with this shut down, somewhat angry person, now should I ask this person the question? Knowing just in the first second of opening that door, that's what the person was faced with. I mean, it's an eye opener, isn't it? <laughs> it it's really startling when you think, because we never consider, all we know is what we want, and how they're gonna, they need to serve it up to us, and they're not doing that. 
So it's their fault. But what are, what are we bringing to the conversation? It's pretty intense when you look at that. So there's some, then there's some owning my situation. Again, I'm an inner being on this path to really transform. I'm an inner being, so wow. Yeah, I'm not presenting that well, and I'm pretty angry, and I'm looking kind of fierce, and how could they ever approach me? How could they ever kind of reduce? Like, of course, they're also posturing themselves to kind of defend, because when you're in the force of some great evil, you need to kind of be like, okay, you know, I've got to go to battle with her as well. So we're also fuel throwing fuel on the fire from our attitude, but we've never seen it before, maybe. Never realized. Blinded by our agenda, but blinded by those negative parts of our ego. That, Devin. Okay. <laughs> yes. I looked impenetrable. And impenetrable because I had put up my armor because I was feeling vulnerable. <clears throat> and I didn't want to be taken advantage of. Right. I wanted to protect myself, and so I had this really, like a wall, you know, like I was putting up a wall. Right. So, and it's interesting, um, thank you for mentioning the word vulnerable. Vulnerable. It's a big word bantered around now in our culture. Uh, there was a sense that vulnerability a long time was not okay. Some of you may still feel that way. Vulnerability is not okay. It, it appears to be weakness, weakness, and um, and then some of you have read Brené Brown, the sociologist, brilliant, you know. So she's the one who kind of broke it out there that vulnerability is actually, she says, the birthplace of creativity, innovation, and change. Well, that's different. That's different. And I had somebody, you might, know, my, my dad passed away in early July. And I have a friend that is often texting me, how am I doing? And it's very sweet, and very nice, he's very supportive. And occasionally at the end, when I'll just say, yeah, I'm cleaning this out of the house now, or I'm taking care of the paperwork for this. And these are just things you do. You know, it's no big deal, it's no big horror, but it's, sometimes it's a pain, but it's no big deal. And, and then he'll always say, like, be strong. Or be strong, stay strong. Be, and, I, and I wrote back to him recently and I went, well, you know, what about, I think being vulnerable right now is really helpful for me. To feel the vulnerability. I don't need to feel all the strength of, my dad just passed away. Like, I don't want to armor myself. I want to feel that. I want to feel the sadness when it arises at times. I want to feel like I have the memories and miss him at times. And so, so I find that that creativity, innovation, and change is helpful when you feel the hole in your heart, you know, or you feel afraid of someone. You know, and then you get a glimpse of yourself and you may feel afraid of your own ferocity and realizing that, um, wow, I'm putting this out there. So suddenly it's like, okay, so I can innovate and I can change and I can do something different. Do something different. When you went back and replayed and re rewound and then pushed the play button again, what, what happened? Any observations? Did you do the exact same behavior? What, what was different? What did you try that was different? Did it change anything in the situation? Yeah. Well, I was able to talk to them instead of just acting it out. Um, and did you notice if you did something different, because a lot of you were nodding, if you did something different, um, did they change at all? They didn't change, okay. Some of them did change. Some did change, right? So it, it's interesting because we'd like to change others, but the only one you can change is yourself. That's it. So you can give up the whole trying to change this other person, but when you do change because you are part of the world, the ripple goes out. That ripple effect goes out, okay? And that's gonna touch them and, that's, and then they will change. So that's always been significant. However, I'm not going to set myself up to expect them to change. Let that go. It's just about me showing up with as much wisdom and compassion, that, pro that good motivation as I can have, bringing that. And, and noticing also when I am off kilter and I'm not feeling much wisdom and compassion and, and just noticing that and then being kind to myself. How about basic love, 
kindness, self-compassion, love and, and kindness directed towards myself, also the self-compassion. It's a huge part of the practice, and we forget that. We feel like we're not allowed that. Okay? It has to happen. It has to happen for us to be able to one day embrace the other and to create a healthy relationship with the other, especially. So again, you can again sit over and over in it, but I mentioned the very beginning is just take it to the breath, the basic mindfulness practice. Okay? And then what I notice from the breath is as it calms you down, because it automatically does that, and I start just noticing the flying bubbles, of, and I might say, oh, these really non-virtuous thoughts, whatever, oh, I should, it, it's not like I shouldn't have these thoughts, the thoughts are just happening. So let them go, okay, they're happening, it's just out of a habit, they're happening, that's all. I don't need to get any more involved in them. And eventually they stop happening. They slow down and stop happening. And then another breath. And this is me doing the best I can. Okay? And then this is me with the breath. Oh, wait a minute. This morning I had a motivation. And the motivation was that I'd like to reach that fully awakened state. And you might have your own motivations and your own words. Why? Because I want to benefit all living beings. That is actually my motivation every morning. Can I direct the activities of my body, speech, and mind as much as I can throughout the day? Right? I know I may not get it going all day, but as much as I can throughout the day towards something positive that will get me enlightened so I can benefit all living beings. That's one of my waking motivations in bed. Okay? Now here I am later in the day, and here's my challenging person and I'm, all the doors and windows are shutting, and I'm not comfortable right now, and I feel my heart's racing a little bit, and I'm a little clammy, and my breath's a little short, and suddenly, yeah, I am really wanted to benefit all living beings, except them. <laughs> That's really what's going on, right? So here I am, oh, a few deep breaths. Well, that gives me some perspective, and now what I can do is re-establish a good motivation. All living beings, all living beings, and right now, especially them. Especially them. Is it challenging? Of course it's challenging. Not, it's, I'm saying this is, it. this is not an easy path. Especially them. Okay, that's right. I did wake up. I want to become a fully awakened being and devote, direct my activities, body, speech, and mind to something positive, benefit all living beings. Okay, especially them. Okay, now I have the motivation there. Nice. Okay, now here I am in front of them. And then you can start the exercises, just as I want to be happy and don't want to suffer. Well, they want the same thing. You know, just I have Buddha nature. They have Buddha nature too. Does their Buddha nature seem to be more obscure than mine? Well, it seems that way, but I don't really know. What if I look out through their eyes and look back at me? Well, that's pretty ugly. Okay, well, I think we're kind of the same there. Well, we have all these things in common. Yeah. Do, are they probably operating from the best that they can operate? Well, probably. How much do I really know about them? When I said that, there's some co-workers. Do you know everything about them? No. We think we do. We have them sorted. We think we do. The people in my office with this one guy that everybody hated, and people had stories about him, but they didn't know anything about him. They never socialized with him. They never asked him about his childhood. They never asked him where he lived and who he lived with, or did he live alone, or what was it like for him. And, that nobody ever conversed with him like that. But we think we know. And they were like, oh yeah, he's like that. He's always like, he's, we had him sorted. I, I know, I always find it interesting when, when I travel and I'm in another country and um, someone will say to me, oh, where are you from? You know, and then I say the States. And they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> what, what is that? Like they have me sorted, the States. The States is a big country, you know. It's different as we know it, from Vermont to Alabama to California and Illinois. It's all different. Everybody's different. But, you know, so I always find that interesting. You know, they, boom, done. <laughs> Got you all wrapped up in a little box. And, okay. So these are just ways in. And humor is a wonderful one to use. Use humor with your delusions. You're noticing the negative thoughts. You know, and I, I sometimes have, here comes my challenging person. Okay, they're walking in towards me right now, and I'm a little bit like, is there an exit hatch here? You know, where can I get out of here? Oh, I really don't want to talk to this person right now. Here they come. They're smiling, making their beeline over to me. <clears throat> and 
and then I'll suddenly, and then they start saying something, or I'm in a meeting, and somebody's saying something, and, I'm, and part of me is like, this guy's an idiot. Right? I'm a Buddhist nun, I'm not a perfect person. I mean, sometimes I have these thoughts, right? I'm a human being. But you have these thoughts, these non-generous thoughts, and I just notice, but I will have a time in the back of my mind, I'll have a little voice that'll be like, do not open your mouth right now, Amy. <laughs> I'll look at the person. No, do not open your mouth. You do not need to go there. No, just smile, mm -hmm. nod. It's okay. So, you know, in humor, I think it's really helpful. Have a lightness about it instead of, you know, we're trying to get enlightened, not in heavy. You know, no, but it, it is nice to bring a lightness to, to the interactions. Like that, the other person may feel lighter as well and think, well, she's not all that bad. Like I was ready, to, I was armored because she was armored the last time we interacted, it was negative. This is, this is okay, she seems relaxed, like that. So here's a higher level. Some of you have heard teachings on emptiness. Teachings on emptiness. Emptiness is a very profound part of our philosophy. What are things empty of? What they're empty of is, is terms called inherent nature, inherent existence. I will give you synonyms for inherent existence, a very hard concept for us to understand. What is that inherent nature? Okay, Intrinsic value, independent existence, concrete reality, things existing from their own side with their own nature. That's the way we think everything exists. In a sense, things are concretized. They are reified. I'm giving you all these synonyms for this. Okay, This is the way we go through space. This is concrete. This will be here for all time. Innately, that's how I think about it. That's not how it is. That's not how it is. And we're constantly bouncing off, we're energy bouncing off of all other kinds of energy. Here comes my difficult person. Okay? We want to analyze with the thought of emptiness and karma. We want to analyze with that. What does that mean? Okay, here they are, walking towards me. Now we never have this much time to analyze. This is why you go back to your cushion to a more formal meditation practice, and I go, God, it was a terrible interaction with that person. What was happening? Okay, they're walking towards me. I visualize that. Okay. Did I ever analyze what's really there? Well, there's an oblong shaped thing like this, the head. There's that. Okay, that has some material on the top. Well, not much with me, but sometimes there's some material. And there's two round things here that often have color. Okay? There's some other features, and then there's a hole here, and out of this hole comes sound. That's the head. Everybody with me? Okay. There's a longer torso-shaped thing, and off of that are four appendages. Usually when they're walking towards you, it's covered with some kind of cloth, let's hope. Okay? Okay. Sometimes it's not. Okay? Covered with cloth. And then, and that's the, the raw information or data, I'm going to say, that's out there. Everybody with me? There they are. That's all that's out there. I've got the fleshy thing, I've got the torso, appendages, and here they are. Now, karma means, karma means action. Sanskrit word for action. Cause and effect. And that means that every moment I act, think, and say, it leaves an imprint in my consciousness, in my mind. If I do and say and think good things, it leaves a positive imprint in my mind that will ripen in future happiness for me. If I do negative things and I yell at people and I um, think negative thoughts and do negative actions from that, it leaves negative imprints in my mind that will ripen in future suffering for me. So how does karma ripen? I don't know, it's very intricate. You need a highly realized mind to understand how it ripens. Okay? But right now, a negative karmic seed is ripening, and here comes my difficult person. And what that negative karmic seed ripening means is what's playing on the movie screen of my mind right now is something that I don't really want to be near. And what happens is I project onto that raw information, the raw data of that being, I underestimate what's out there. So I project something negative, less than what's really there, onto that being. And then because I project that negative thing, now this opens and sound comes out and I interpret it as something negative. That's how karma and emptiness relate and that's how they work together. Everybody with me? 
to some degree, again, karmic seed in my mind that is there is ripening. It's a negative karmic seed. Person's coming in front of me, and I underestimate the reality. That's what the negative karmic seed causes me to do, especially when I'm not aware of my mind and I'm not being an inner being. An inner being is kind of waking up and going, well, negative karmic seed ripening in my mind right now. That's the only reason I'm projecting a real negative scene onto this person, but that's not exactly the way they exist because they're empty of that inherently negative enemy, other, challenging person nature. How do I know they lack that? Empty means they lack that. They don't have that concrete negativeness. Why? Because everybody would view them that way. That's how inherent things are. They do not change. They don't come from other things. They're not a conglomeration of other things. Okay? They're, always, they're frozen in time and space. So that negative person that I project, highly negative, enemy, horrible, terrible person out there, okay? if I feel, and I feel invested that they are inherently like that, if they are inherently like that, again, everybody has to see them that way. So sometimes you're challenging person. Have you ever noticed? Some people like them. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> How is that possible? <laughs> they suck. How is it possible that this person is friends with them? I, I, how is it possible when the boss that you don't like is yelling at you and somebody in the office is happy about that? Right? You're having a terrible time, but somebody thinks that's great. Let's analyze. Let's go back. All that's happening with the fleshy oblong thing is it's getting red now because he's yelling. Out of this comes sound. That's all that's happening. If you want to dial it back, it's just sound coming out. It can be, mm, 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 mm. But my negative karmic seed ripening, I interpret it as negative, and I don't like it and I'm uncomfortable. Somebody suddenly has a positive karmic seed ripening and they don't like me, and they're like, yeah, it's getting yelled at. This is how it works, so it's a way with karma and emptiness to create more of a fluidity in our everyday lives as we bump up against all these different energetic patterns and our behaviors and our minds. Make sense? So we need to kind of take it in of, what's my experience? What's, what's my mind telling me? What's, what's happening right now? Can I find a more gentle approach? Even in my discomfort, and here's another thing about discomfort. Americans don't like this, right? My practice, a lot of my practice is getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. Getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. The more I operate with uncomfortable people and I do my exercises, it really releases them in, in my mind from there being a really negative person there. So I become more comfortable. And I'm much more um, used to dealing and bringing up the patterns and the exercises I need to do, sometimes right in the face of the person, or I do it back on my cushion when I'm sitting. More readily, those patterns, the healthy patterns are more readily available to me because I practice. And so through that process, when it becomes uncomfortable, I'm also kind of used to it now. It's like, yeah, well, life's uncomfortable. Who said you're going to be comfortable all the time? Like that. I was just telling a story at dinner um, to Devin and Harry about, so my nephew was living with me for seven months. He's in his late 20s. He's a wonderful guy. And when he heard about a job that I had that I loved, and he heard that I didn't like doing these reports for the job, and later he questioned me, and said, but I thought you loved that job. And he was having trouble with jobs. He would get a job and there were some things he didn't like at the job and he would quit. He had something in his mind that he's supposed to like every aspect of the job. I don't know who taught him that. His parents did not. I don't know where he got that notion. So then I looked at him and I said, well, I did love that job. And he said, but you said you didn't like the reports. And I went, well, I didn't. And he looked confused and I said, you know, I said, sweetie, you're not going to love everything about the job. That's not life. That just sets yourself up for utter disappointment and frustration. So, and I do notice a lot of younger people of that age, they have this idea they're supposed to love every aspect of what they're doing. And I don't know where they got that from. Because so, so once I kind of, over and over, I said, oh, no, life's not like that. And life can be great because you realize that. So, so he's, he's in a much better space now, in general, uh, accepting. There's an acceptance 
acceptance. So with our other person as well, what kind of acceptance can we have? And what kind of forgiveness when they mess up? Do you forgive yourself? Do you need to forgive yourself when you've messed up? Have you not done that yet? Do you not accept certain things about yourself? Like that? Because that's where it starts. If I can get soft in here, in my inner beingness, that, that will come out where I can come from a place of more loving kindness, more gentleness. Questions? Comments? Yes. I do have a question. Um, going back to what you're talking about with um, karma and emptiness, can you talk about really where fear fits in with karma and that karmic seed? Because for me, that's the negative thought is actually just fear. That um, and so, what is happening with my karma and fear? What is so, fear doing one that? thing that's helpful, if it's possible, is to analyze fear. What do you think is underneath fear? Like when you get afraid, what what is happening for you? Do you think? Well, a lot, a lot of times I don't think it's even conscious. I think it's it's it, it's some very very. I think it's some, it's just some very old reactivity that's just ancient. Uh huh. Yeah. Some of it is for sure. Yeah. What other people? What do you think about your fear when you're when you have fear arise? Any idea of what? What's underneath it? Unknown or change. Uh huh. How about change? Isn't that fun? We all love change, don't we? Right? And the thing is, the interesting thing with change, change is related to it for certain. Change is um, the only thing you can count on. It's happening all the time. You can't stop change. Everything's changing. Everything's changing all the time. It's ego based. Ego based for sure. Ego based. And what about the ego? And please, yeah. Loss of control. Loss of control. Ding, ding, ding. Right? She wins the award. Loss of control. But when you really look at fear, a lot of times it's, it's about the, the C word, the control thing. I, I need a certain control. You know, you're walking down a dark lit street and you think someone's following you. There's that kind of fear. Right? So I don't have control of my environment. I, don't, I may not have control of somebody doing something with my body that I don't want. Or attacking me or stealing something from me. You know, there's that level. And then we have bigger kind of life issues. Things feel out of control. And we have fear about money, and we have fear about where we're going to live, and fear about how we manifest in the world, and fear about who our partners are, and on and on, and fear about our kids, and fear about health issues. And these are you know, certain. Now there's concern, which is different than fear. Concern, I think, takes a rational approach, a realistic approach. Can I do something about this? What do I need to do? Do I need to engage anything? But fear ro rotates into the out of, con out of control stuff. There's nothing I can really do about it. So some of it, I think, is innate, which would come from a karmic propensity to suffer from fear and things like that. And I think that does, where there's previous moments of my consciousness, previous moments of my mind that have more of a habit of fear in it than other things. So what's helpful and what they often tell us in our Buddhist practice and our Buddhist passage is to start to identify what your delusions are. Okay? Delusions, I mean an imbalance in your mind. And I mean things like all rooted in fundamental ignorance or confusion. I have a misknowing of reality. K N O W. I misknow reality. Because, why? Because I don't have a direct perception of emptiness, the nature of reality. And because of that, I underestimate certain things as karma arises, and then I over embellish certain things. And that creates attachment. So when I underestimate, that creates aversion and hatred. And when I over embellish, that creates attachment and desire. Those are the three root delusions. Ignorance, attachment, and hatred. And then from those spring other delusions. Pride, jealousy, anxiety, depression, fear. Things. So you get the idea of what imbalance in the mind. So they say, and when I just mentioned a bunch of those for you right now, 
laziness is another one, forgetfulness is, you know, it goes on and on. Um, when I mentioned some, some of them popped up for you bigger than others. Some people are very attached, that's their big thing. You know, some people it's anger. Some people it's a combination, but they say know your main delusions and go after those first by learning what the antidotes are and practicing over and over when you can, if you can, in formal meditation. I can't stress it enough. And if you can't, just trying to use some mindfulness practice to counter great sweeps of negativity from coming out of you, things like that. So I don't know if that's helpful. You know, and understanding that the fundamental nature of my mind, it, it, the mind has two qualities, by the way, according to Tibetan Buddhism, two main characteristics. We've talked about this before, and it's very nice to see so many familiar faces um, here, so, and some new faces as well. So the mind has two qualities in Tibetan Buddhism. Any idea, if you haven't heard this before, any idea what those two qualities are? Your mind or consciousness, same thing. What do you think those qualities are? Your mind. What's it like? Any guesses? Curiosity. Curiosity. That, that's layered in one of the qualities, certainly. Storytelling. Storytelling is also part of one of the qualities. The mind does those things. Yep. Seems like it's endless. Or endless? Endless. How would you say it's endless? Can you describe that a little bit? Um, I don't know what boundaries there are. No boundaries? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. No boundaries to the mind. That would describe a little bit of one of the qualities. Okay, I'm going to give you... I'm going to give you the first one. Are you ready? You're sitting down. This is a little shocking for people. Your mind is clear. That's one of its actual characteristics. Is that what your mind's like? Because most people are like, my mind's busy. Busyness is my mind. Most people say that first. One aspect of your mind is clarity. Clarity. And you go, well, that's not my mind. Okay, but that's actually your mind. Second quality is awareness. Awareness. So curiosity, storytelling, come into moments of consciousness, the awareness, like that. Um, the mind is a continuum. They say it has no beginning and no end because every moment of the consciousness has a moment before the, that caused it, and a moment before that caused it, a moment before. If you have a lot of fear in your mind, it's usually because there's a pattern of fear in your mind. More moments of fear causing the next moment of fear, the next moment of fear, the next moment of fear, the next moment of fear. We all know we have different personalities and different traits. I know some people, they tend towards depressiveness, right? I know some people that are always happy when I see them. I know some people that have really, really good heart. They're always thinking about others and how to help people. And then I know some people that are, you know, they're not the nicest of people. They're, they're okay, but they always have a little snippy, kind of sarcastic barb somehow. And we just, we're all different. And it's just because that's what our minds are familiar with. What is your mind familiar with? Okay? Sometimes it's anger. Sometimes it's frustration. Frustration is a lesser degree of anger. If I can catch myself at frustration, maybe I can stop my mind from getting into full-blown anger by noticing it at frustration or irritation or annoyance first. Okay? So it's very helpful to just understand that actually when I'm suffering from a big delusion, one of the big antidotes to any type of delusion is remind myself of the nature of my mind, that it's actually clear and aware, that's all. And right now, I'm aware of anger in my mind, or I'm aware of fear in my mind, but actually my mind is clear, is, is really a clear, has a clear light nature in its most subtle experience. So that helps to cut a little bit of my hanging on to like, I'm always like this, and I'll always be like this. So we're nearly out of time, is there, um, any other questions about anything in Buddhism as well, and anything we talked about this evening? I have a question. Yes. What would you um, think of as the best way to practice self-forgiveness? Self-forgiveness, what's the best way to practice that? I think is um, being honest with yourself about what, being very clear about what you need to forgive yourself for. I think it's also helpful, and Des Archbishop Desmond Tutu has a beautiful book called The Book of Forgiving with his daughter, wrote it, and there's some exercises, and part of it is 
is number one, to tell your story about what you need to forgive. And if you can, you can tell it to yourself, but it's really nice to have a witness, somebody you trust and that you feel safe with. You kind of say, this keeps coming up for me, so I can't seem to release myself from this. Here's what's going on for me. And to be honest, and, and sometimes you might need the other person to continue to ask you a sim the same question over and over. What is it that you need to be forgiven for? And then you'll roll out one level. And they'll sit with you and they might say, what is it you need to be forgiven for? And you'll notice other layers come out. So then part of that is once you kind of feel you got the story out, it's a little bit in the compassion for yourself is noting that I don't need there's no point in hanging on. You know, I was doing the best I could. And, and, and so then there's practicing, um, let, like realizing like, was doing the best I could. I made mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Um, I can certainly do a remedial action if, if I need to ask somebody, you know, say I'm sorry to someone or do something reverse of what I was doing if it's possible. Sometimes that's not necessary and it's too late. Person's passed away. Like that, sometimes I can put the person, visualize them in front of me, even if they've passed away, and say what I want to say to them and be kind to them and say I'm really blew it and I messed up. That can be very healing. And then you let it go, and then it's kind of like I'm okay. Like you know, and I and you can even say words to yourself, making sure and say it over and over that I forgive you, forgive you. Visualize yourself across from you. Do the exercise over and over. Now don't be surprised and let it go and be like, this is the best I could do right now. Don't be surprised if you wake up the next morning and you need to forgive again. Some things take more time to forgive. But the process is really powerful. He has more in the book about it. It's really useful, really helpful. Yes? Um, how important is it to reconcile with the person in actuality if they're not dead? I mean, is it is it enough to reconcile with them in a kind of a dinner way, or, or is it important to go to them? If they're not dead, if they're alive, it's really helpful. If, and I always say that you can always say you're sorry. It, it cuts and diffuses so many problems. You know, so we have a, a big, in Lo Jong teachings, mind training, we have a, one of the verses of the eight verses of mind training, it's a very profound text, is, um, has a, a section that says, Offer the victory to others. Okay? Now, when we're dug in, and I know I'm right, and this guy's a jerk, there's no way I'm going to do it. So you can keep it fueled, the adversity. Where does that get anybody? Really painful, I find. So there's times, and I know one time at a center, um, I was running the center, a woman came for retreat for a few weeks, very unhappy with whatever we did. She just wasn't a happy person railed on all the staff, ended up needing to talk to the director about how unhappy her time was. Came in to talk to me and, you know, and, and uh, we had a really good staff. And so I spoke to her, but right in the beginning, I just said to her, I didn't think we had done anything wrong, personally. But I did apologize to her sincerely that I was really sorry it was not the experience that she was hoping to have. And I was very sorry if we had contributed to any of that. And I really meant that. Not that I thought we contributed to any of it, but I really meant like whatever her experience was, and it totally diffused the whole, she wanted, she came in and wanted to fight with me. That was how she goes through space, and, and I said, I am truly sorry. And I said it a couple times that, that this was not the experience, and you know, if you want your money back, you can have your money back. Well, she wasn't expecting, you know, she was like, what, what do you say to that? What can you say? So it just stopped her in her tracks. And I have had some people where I did say, sincerely apologizing, and they threw the words back at me, still angry. But later that day, I noticed something shifted, and suddenly they're giving me like a little gift. That, like it shifts the energy unbelievably to apologize. And then if it's possible to do a remedial action if you feel you need it, um, you know, you broke something of the person's in anger, and you, you know, buy them a new dish or buy them flowers. I just felt like I wanted to make a peace offering. You know, I've had people do that, and that can be a nice gesture as well. Not as necessary, but apologizing, I find, is, is so much cuts the tension. And then sometimes you see them on the other side, yeah, I'm sorry too, you know, I was 
just sitting in my head and I, I had a terrible weekend and you know and suddenly there's connection positive connection so let's finish there and I, I want to mention um, if you would like more of this we have a night at the catamount in St. Johnsbury tomorrow night I know that people from Montpelier don't drive anywhere, so I realize that's far. I understand. You know, when I when I lived here, I lived in Vermont for five and a half years at Miller Apis Center, and I kind of and I had come from California. I, I'm from Philadelphia. I'm not from California, but I lived in California many years, and in California, everybody drives too much. So you have that extreme. In Vermont, nobody wants to drive anywhere, and at night, you know, the roads are dark and they're not well lit, and there's animals and. So I kind of was getting used to it. I was like, I'm like, it's just an hour. Over that's 45 minutes. Like, what's the problem? And anyway, St. Jay. But we are having a weekend retreat, Friday evening to Sunday afternoon um, at Milarepa, that will definitely deliver a deeper level of a lot of our philosophy with more meditation. If you'd like to join us for that, fantastic. Um, but what you really must join me for is this pilgrimage. I unfortunately have one, I forgot to bring my cards, but my website's on here, amymiller.com, if you want to see what I'm doing, because there's another retreat on the Hudson at Garrison Institute the following weekend in New York, if you want to come down and have an experience like that, the Path of Joy, but a lot of other activities. I'm also teaching in Western Massachusetts on my way south and Southern Vermont and Grafton after here. So this is a pilgrimage I'm leading in May 2020. I led the last one last October, and we had a wonderful group of people to go to this remote retreat center called Laudo. I've done a lot of retreats there. It's in the Mount Everest region of Nepal. And um, we actually trek in Nepal, so you have the magnificent scenery, and then we do a three-day retreat at the retreat center that's optional. So if you're not a particular Buddhist, if you want to bring a non-Buddhist with you and they just want to explore, it's beautiful. And then I take people on a day outing in Kathmandu to some holy places that I like. And you get the whole bustle of the Kathmandu experience, complete with our you know, mask because it's very polluted there and things. And then we'll also have a day outing in the area of Laudo, around the mountains there, to see some very holy places there. Of many, And I know many of the people there, so we're going to be visiting some friends of mine, and it's very special. So if you want kind of a trekking in Nepal experience with a more spiritual aspect, um, please consider come up, if you'd like, come up and take a photo of this, and then you also have my website, and all the details, the itinerary is on my website. It, I can't stress enough how wonderful, I know it costs money, it's, it's not cheap, but it's really worthwhile, and everything's taken care of for you. So I do hope to see you again, and I want to thank you so much for joining us this evening. And anything else you wanted me to say? Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please be kind. That's, that's the most important. Please be kind to yourself, and then we'll be kind to all others. Thank you so much. And so may we dedicate in closing, as our other little book into our motivation, whatever positive energy we've created from this time together, may we invest it in helping our minds be more peaceful and opening our hearts so we can reach a place of full awakening and be of the most benefit to all living beings. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.